Good afternoon. Let me add my thanks and my appreciation uh, to our Grand Master, John Cooper, and to Paul Rich uh, for bringing us all together here today to talk about two very important people. And certainly, from a personal point of view, thank you for uh, asking me to um, contribute some of my own thoughts about it. Uh, it's pretty much an honor to be speaking with the three men who spoke uh, before me. Um, and before I get started, I want to thank a couple people. I want to thank my brother and colleague Adam Kendall and brother Jeff Renholtz, who are here, here today, um, who really uh, spent a lot of time and work gathering the records of Sequoia Lodge for me. I was able to go through thousands of pages of lodge minutes and lodge records and applications and Tyler's registers to really sort of understand Earl Warren's uh, participation in Freemasonry. And I learned a lot from that process, and certainly um, I learned more and gained more from that process than I'll ever be able to put in a paper like this uh, today, but I did want to thank them uh, for the sacrifice they made to help me with this paper. Uh, that, uh, as was said, I've titled The Apron and the Robe, Masonic Principles Embodied in the Life and Work of Earl Warren. Earl Warren wore a number of badges in his life. These badges ranged from the uniform he wore as a first lieutenant in the United States Army to the badge he carried as the district attorney of Alameda County, to the apron he wore as a mason, and the robe he wore as Chief Justice of the United States. Each of these badges carried with it certain authority, certain responsibilities, certain obligations, and certain traditions. Today I will focus on two badges Earl Warren wore during his life the white Masonic apron, and the black judicial robe. There is little information about the origin of the black robe. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor recently wrote in the Smithsonian Magazine, it is surprising to me how little we know about where this plain black judicial robe comes from. She notes that in the earliest days of our court system, the black robe was common but not universal. But she does report the time when most people believe the black robe was firmly established in practice. She writes, it is believed that by 1801, when John Marshall became Chief Justice, the justices were in the habit of wearing black. Today, every federal and state judge in the country wears a very similar, simple black robe. O'Connor is drawn to the customs, the ritual, if you will, that accompanies the black robe. My fondest thoughts about my robe, she says, have to do with the tradition at the Supreme Court for putting it on. On argument days, a buzzer sounds about five minutes before argument begins. The justices go to the robing room, the court's version of a locker room. Each justice has a locker. Attendants help the justices fasten their robes. Then the justices without fail, engage in a wonderful custom. Each justice shakes the hand of every other justice before walking into the courtroom. An important reminder that despite the justice's occasional difference in opinion, the court is a place of collegiality and common purpose. I wonder if the justices who were also Masons see the same similarity I do in the custom and tradition of putting on the Masonic robe, the Masonic apron. In the moments before a lodge is opened, Masons gather in the anteroom or just inside the lodge room and put on their aprons. They make their way to a seat in the lodge, stopping or being stopped to shake hands and greet their brothers, men from all walks of life, all religions, and all social backgrounds who despite the distinctions created in the outside world are equal or on the level, as we say, in the lodge room. The apron is a leveling symbol that unites Masons and makes the lodge a place of fraternity and common purpose. Whether Chief Justice Earl Warren ever thought about this similarity, I may never know, but he has recorded enough of his own voice in history that I am comfortable saying he wore both the black judicial robe and the white Masonic apron with great pride and with an appropriate reverence 
for their symbolism. Earl Warren received his Masonic apron on October 11th, 1919, when he was initiated and entered apprentice mason in Sequoia Lodge number 349 in Oakland. Warren applied to receive the degrees of masonry a month earlier on September 2nd, 1919, and was elected to membership on October 7th. Actually, this was the second time Warren petitioned this lodge. He submitted his first application three years earlier in October of 1916, but on that occasion, his application was rejected. The election of an applicant to receive the degrees of masonry requires a unanimous vote of the lodge. Having been rejected, or blackballed as it's sometimes called, at least one member of Sequoia Lodge was not ready to admit Warren into Freemasonry in 1916. I don't know the reason for his rejection, but it is clear that whatever the reason was, it was resolved by 1919, and Warren joined the ranks of Freemasonry and became a notable part of the history of our fraternity. Earl Warren was an engaged, enthusiastic, and dedicated Freemasonry. I say this because there are some men who are also well known in history that were Masons, but only in a passive way. This was not the case with Warren. Earl Warren quickly advanced through the degrees of Masonry. He received his second degree on October 16, 1919, and his third degree on November 1, 1919. This tells me that he had a good memory. <laughs> he was a quick study, and he had a substantial desire to progress through the degrees of masonry. There is a good deal of work that a candidate for the degrees has to memorize and recite back to his brother in an open lodge before he can receive the next degree. He would not have been able to progress as quickly as he did without dedicating several hours every day to the study of this work. Warren was an officer of the lodge for seven years, serving as master in 1928. That same year, he was elected president of the Masters and Past Masters Association of Alameda County, which demonstrates that the leader of the fraternity in that, the leaders in the, of the fraternity in that county held him in high esteem. He was involved in the concordant bodies of Freemasonry and took on leadership positions there. He was potentate of the Ami Shrine Temple in 1933 and venerable master of the Oakland Scottish Rite bodies in 1945. And if you were listening to his history earlier, he was venerable master when he was governor of California. He served Grand Lodge on a number of committees and was elected the Grand Master of Masons of California in 1935 serving through October of 1936. Though he went on to positions of great influence in state and federal government, Warren continued his relationship with his lodge, often serving as the installing officer for the annual installation of officers. I never knew Earl Warren, but because of our Masonic ties, I feel like I understand him. While we lived in different times and led very different lives, we're both Masons, and I find the bonds of fraternity very strong between us. As I have read about his life, and having had the opportunity to read some of his own words as Grand Master of Masons and as the Chief Justice, I observe the core principles of Freemasonry embodied in the way he lived his life, the way he acted, and the judgment he exercised on the Supreme Court. Today I want to share a few of those observations with you. I do not intend to establish a cause and effect relationship between his membership and leadership in Freemasonry to his history making actions on the Supreme Court. Nor will I attempt any historical or legal analysis of his work. I'm sure you're relieved by that. <laughs> I simply wish to point out what I recognize as Masonic principles reflected in his work. Why is this important to me? Why would it be important to any Mason? Because as Masons, we are taught and we each personally strive to practice the principles of Masonry in our daily lives, to find ways to translate these very well-written words on a page 
to intentional and obvious behaviors in our lives. This is not an easy thing to do. But when we see that a man such as Warren was able to accomplish it, we are inspired to continue our efforts to be better men and to do good for others. I want to refocus now on the period of Warren's Masonic membership from 1919 to 1929. During these 10 years, Warren went to lodge nearly every Tuesday night. He served in nearly every office in the lodge. This means he memorized a significant portion of the ritual. During this period, Sequoia Lodge received hundreds of applications for membership. In fact, they read between five and 15 applications every month. The lodge was very busy conferring degrees and the meeting minutes and the Tyler's Register of Sequoia Lodge reveal that Warren himself performed hundreds of degrees during that 10 year period. His good memory and dedication served him well. Warren memorized and delivered over and over again the many teachings of Freemasonry when he was between the ages of 28 and 38, likely very formative years in his adult life. Like Warren and like many of you in the room today, I have also memorized much of this same ritual. Over the last 22 years, I have performed it more than 100 times myself. I find this work and the repetition of the work useful because during times of challenge and crisis in my life, I tap into this ritual. I recite the words to myself and I'm caused to remember the important principles they imply. It helped me gain perspective almost immediately. It clears my mind and gives me almost instantly an idea of what is right and what is important. In reflecting back on his most active days in Sequoia Lodge, Earl Warren wrote the following in a letter to the Lodge Master, Owen Anker, on October 11th, 1952, from the governor's office in Sacramento. My own membership in Sequoia has given me many enriching experiences, he writes. The lessons I learned in the three degrees of the craft have guided me through many difficult situations, and I have always been sustained by the fraternal affection of our brethren. Many of the lessons of the craft are found in the several passages of the ritual which help shape our thinking and guide our actions. Here are just a few passages from Masonic ceremonies that particularly resonate with me as being consistent with Earl Warren's most important work. This first passage describes one of the three principal tenets of Freemasonry, brotherly love. By the exercise of brotherly love, we are taught to regard the whole human species as one family, the high and the low, the rich and the poor, who as created by one almighty parent and inhabitants of the same planet are to aid, support, and protect each other. This is the description of one of the working tools of the second degree used in the installation ceremony. The level, my brother, demonstrates that we are descended from the same stock, that we partake of the same nature and share the same hope, and that although distinctions among men are necessary to preserve subordination, yet no eminence of station should make us forget that we are brethren. For he who is placed on the lowest spoke of fortune's wheel is entitled to our regard. And this last passage describes one of Freemasonry's four cardinal virtues, justice. Justice is that standard or boundary of right which enables us to render unto every man his just due without distinction. These represent just a small sample of the ritual Earl Warren studied, memorized, and conveyed to others in his lodge. And it is these principles that are so obvious to me in his life and work. Total equality, respect for all regardless of one's station in life, fairness, concern for those less capable or able, 
These are Masonic principles that I see embodied in the work of Earl Warren. As Masons, we believe that equality is achieved when all people have access to the same information and the same opportunity as everyone else. We believe we have an obligation to level the playing field by elevating everyone to the same plane. I see these ideas come alive time and again in Earl Warren's life and work. Let me provide just a few examples from the written work of the Chief Justice in three of his well-known or let's say landmark cases. Miranda versus Arizona. In 1966, the su Supreme Court considered whether it was necessary to embed certain protections into the process of custodial interrogations to ensure that a citizen's Fifth Amendment right to avoid self-incrimination was properly preserved. As we know, the court decided that, in fact, specific notice must be given to those who are taken into custody that they have the right to remain silent and that they have the right to legal counsel. The court ordered that those in custody must be warned that anything they say can be used against them in trial and that counsel will be provided to them at no cost if they cannot otherwise afford counsel. This notice is now known as the Miranda warning. We've all heard it, maybe not in custody, <laughs> but you have the right to remain silent and so on. Many have made the observation that this and similar decisions by the Warren Court reflect the Chief Justice's negative view of law enforcement, a view that he acquired after a long tenure as the District Attorney of Alameda County and as Attorney General of California. There might be some merit to this observation. There is no doubt that Earl Warren saw some of the best and some of the worst law enforcement practices during that service. There is also plenty written into this decision to support the fact that he had a vast knowledge of how evidence is obtained in criminal cases. As a Mason, however, I see certain other principles in this decision. Principles not targeted at law enforcement, but principles of fairness, justice, and concern for mankind, especially those in need or at a disadvantage. In reading this decision, I am caused to remember our Masonic obligation to give a man due and timely notice if he is in danger of injury to his person or good name. I notice an effort to bring all people to an equal plane with information. I notice in this decision a search for that boundary of right that will render unto every man his just due without distinction. In the decision, Warren wrote, the need for counsel in order to protect the Fifth Amendment privilege exists for the indigent as well as the affluent. In fact, were we to limit these constitutional rights to those who can retain an attorney, our decisions today would be of little significance. The cases before us, as well as the vast majority of confession cases with which we have dealt in the past, involve those unable to retain counsel. While authorities are not required to relieve the accused of poverty, they have an obligation not to take advantage of indigence in the administration of justice. In this decision, I observe a man who regarded the whole human species as one family, the high and the low, the rich and the poor, who are to aid, support, and protect each other. Hernandez versus Texas. This case involved the systematic exclusion of persons of Mexican descent from serving as jurors, although there were such persons fully qualified to serve in Jackson County, Texas, where Pete Hernandez stood for trial, uh, stood trial for murder. The Supreme Court reversed the decision of the lower courts and declared that the Constitution entitled Hernandez and all defendants the right to be indicted and tried by juries selected from among all qualified persons, regardless of national origin or descent. Warren wrote the opinion of the court. In it, he expressed the idea that prejudice is in constant motion. 
that it is subject to change, that one prejudice could be cured, but another might arise. Here is what he wrote. Throughout our history, differences in race and color have defined easily identifiable groups, which at times have required the aid of the courts in securing equal treatment under the law. But community prejudices are not static. And from time to time, other differences from the community norm may define other groups which will need the same protection. When the existence of a distinct class is demonstrated, and it is further shown that the laws as written or applied single out that class for dif different treatment, not based on some reasonable classification, the guarantees of the Constitution have been violated. Warren helps me in this writing understand that prejudice won't end with a war, a single piece of legislation, a treaty. The human existence is constantly evolving, and we must be aware that prejudice will evolve also. Even if we work to level the playing field today, tomorrow may require us to level it again. Perhaps this is why, as Masons, we say we must be ever willing to stretch forth a helping hand to raise those who have fallen. The importance of public education was a popular topic inside Masonic lodges from the time Warren was initiated to the time he served as Grand Master in 1936. In 1920, just months after Warren became a Freemason, Grand Master Charles Adams created Public Schools Week, requiring all lodges in California to become aware of the needs of public schools in their community and to do whatever they could do to address those needs. Public Schools Week has been observed by Masons every year since. Today it is known as Public Schools Month. Year after year, Warren and his brothers were caused to be informed about the state of public schools in Oakland and to, produce, and to promote the school's best interests. In 1928, Warren, as master of the lodge, was responsible to see that Sequoia Lodge observed Public Schools Week in Oakland. Warren took this obligation seriously. It was important to him that Public Schools Week addressed the real issues facing school children and that it not simply be a social activity of the lodge. When he was Grand Master, he was responsible for the statewide observance of Public Schools Week. This observance was important enough to Warren that in his 1936 Grand Master's address to the Grand Lodge, he wrote, I note with interest that there was widespread observance of our 17th annual Public Schools Week, and that another jurisdiction, Georgia, initiated a similar observance this year. It is also gratifying to note that as time passes, Public Schools Week is becoming more of a civic affair than formerly, and that greater emphasis is now being placed upon presenting to the general public a real picture of the activities and school life of the children rather than upon mere entertainment. It was the school life of children that seemed to be important to Warren. In an interesting turn of events, Warren was appointed Chief Justice in October 1953, just as the Supreme Court was hearing arguments in the case known as Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka et al. In Brown versus the Board, Warren and the court considered the question of whether segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive children of the minority group of equal education opportunities. We know the court believed it did. The court ruled that seg segregated educational facilities are inherently unequal and deprive the minority students of equal protection under the law. Warren wrote the opinion of the court and described the drafting process this way. I assigned myself to write the decision, for it seemed to me that something so important ought to issue over the name of the Chief Justice of the United States. In drafting it, I sought to use low-key, unemotional language and keep it short enough 
so that it could be published in full in every newspaper in the country. I kept the text secret. It was locked in my safe until I read it from the bench. This is not a complete, uh, this is not the complete decision, but listen to these 142 words written by the Chief Justice in the Brown decision describing his view of education. Today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to a democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, in preparing him for later professional training, and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may be reasonably expected to succeed if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right, which must be made available to all on equal terms. I believe that these words represent Warren's personal thoughts about education. Why do I believe this? First, because his handwritten draft of this opinion is available to view, and it is very close to the final version. Secondly, because these thoughts are nearly identical to the thoughts Grand Master Warren shared with his brother Masons during his address to the 1936 annual communication. In this report to his Masonic brethren, he did not feel the same need to be low key and unemotional. Here is what Earl Warren said about public education when he was Grand Master of Masons of California, 18 years before the Brown decision. The more I see life, the more firmly I am convinced that the hope of the future lies in the education of youth, not of some children, but of all children, not according to so-called classes of society, but according to wisely conceived an efficiently executed plan that will make available to every child, regardless of his station in life, an equal opportunity to study, learn, and progress upon his own merits in this complicated and ever-changing world. This best can be done, indeed it can only be done by a system of free public education. It is for this reason that the Grand Lodge of California, ever striving as it does, to replace darkness with light is so vitally interested in the public schools in our state. One of the greatest leavening influences in society today is the public schools. It does more to break down distinctions between social and economic groups and to eliminate class consciousness than any other man-made institution. It offers the strongest proof to the world that he who is on the lowest spoke of fortune's wheel may be entitled to our regard. By destroying prejudice and planting reason in its place, it prepares the foundation of a liberty-loving people, the greatest blessing this or any nation has ever had. It seems to me that Warren was quite prepared for the Brown decision when he joined the court as Chief Justice in 1953. He had spent decades considering the implications of equality in public education. Indeed, just as Grand Master Warren advocated in 1936, the Brown decision of 54 planted reason in place of prejudice and laid the foundation for equality in school environments. As Alden Whitman noted in his 1974 obituary of the Chief Justice, from the Brown decision, flowed a score or more of holdings by the court and by inferior courts that collectively st struck down racial inequalities in most areas of public life. As a result, parks, swimming pools, bus terminals, and housing were desegregated. Whitman said, among other things, the Warren Court enunciated the one man, one vote rule, underscored the right of a jury trial, said that wages could not be garnished without warning or a hearing, and made most of the Bill of Rights binding on the states. 
Earl Warren had many titles in his life. He served many different terms of office. One of his longest terms of service was his 55 years as a Mason. Edward Sims, one of my predecessors as Grand Secretary and a past Grand Master of our Grand Lodge, was interviewed in 1970 about his relationship with Earl Warren, shortly after the Chief Justice retired from the Supreme Court. In the interview, Sims indicates that Warren's interest in Freemasonry was still strong in 1970. He said, since he resigned as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, he told me that the teachings of Masonry have been an influence in his life throughout his whole legal career. I usually see Earl Warren in Washington every February. We have dinner together when I go there to the Masonic conferences, and he seems hungry to find out what is going on in Masonry in California. He happens to be in California now. He called me up just last week and said, Ed, I'm com coming over to have lunch with you, or just sit down and talk for a little while. So I know that he has maintained his interest all these years. Sims went on to reflect about Earl Warren as a Mason, and he said, I think that one of the most outstanding features of Earl Warren's Masonic career was not only his devotion to Masonry and to the individual Mason, but the fact that he was willing to help anyone, and he seemed to seek out the one that needed help. Earl Warren died on July 9, 1974. His legacy is large. He means so much to so many different people. To me, as a Mason, he is an inspiration. His life is proof that we can, each one of us, practice out of the Lodge those great moral duties which are inculcated in it. Thank you. <laughs>